Byzantium is a companion piece of sailing to Byzantium. Byzantium is the sequel to sailing to Byzantium. Some critics, poets, and friends of WB Yeats had a problem with certain aspects of sailing to Byzantium. For example, the poet T. Sturge Moore, Thomas Sturge Moore, who was a friend of Yeats, told Yeats that he was not able to comprehend fully what was conveyed by sailing to Byzantium and that he felt let down, he felt let down by the closing stanzas of the poem. Byzantium was Yeats's response to this criticism. Byzantium is more profound more philosophical, more symbolist, more imagist, and certainly more difficult than sailing to Byzantium. The seeds of the poem can be found in a diary entry of W. B. Yeats in a nineteen thirty in a nineteen thirty diary entry of W. B. Yeats. In that diary entry. Yeats speaks of Byzantium towards the end of the first millennium. Byzantium towards the end of the first of the first millennium. And many of the ideas that we meet with in the poem now can be found in the diary entry in a rather unpolished form. Let us examine the title of the poem, Byzantium. The poet could not have provided the poem with a more simple title, just one word, Byzantium. Byzantium started its existence as a Greek colony. Later, under the Romans, it became Constantinople. Today it is Istanbul in modern day Turkey. W.B. Yeats was a very enthusiastic student of the history, culture, and art of the Eastern Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was divided divided into two parts, the Western Roman Empire with Rome as its capital and the Eastern Roman Empire with, with Constantinople as its capital. Constantinople was sporadically referred to as Byzantium. W. B. H. believed that the Eastern Roman Empire in general and its capital city Constantinople, Byzantium in particular, was home to a spiritually unified society. A society which dedicated itself to creating fabulous monuments, proclaiming proclaiming the magnificence of the soul. In fact, around the 10th century, there was what is known as the Byzantine Renaissance. And fabulous, fantastic works of art and architecture were created by the artists, the architects of Byzantium. These works of art, these works of architecture fascinated W.B. Yeats and threw him under a spell. He felt that it was in Byzantium 
towards the end of the first millennium that he would be that his soul would be most comfortable most at peace why be sent to you this is a question i want my students to ask why be sent to him this is a question which i want my students to ask if they have to discuss the title of the poem was it a random choice why be sent to him and why not some other city why not rome for example why not athens for example was it a random choice it was not W. B. Yeats was a profound scholar. He was an avid student of the history of the Eastern Roman Empire, the history, the civilization, the culture, the architecture, the art of the Eastern Roman Empire. And it was after much cogitation after much cogitation after much internal deliberation that the poet chose Byzantium Byzantium is for AIDS the city of perfection the city of salvation because instead of instead of the the obsession the obsession with the body that the poet found around himself he finds in Byzantium an obsession with the mind an obsession with the soul it is a fact that Byzantine civilization attained amazing heights conquered remarkable peaks in art, in architecture. Take for example the Hagia Sophia, the greatest church of the Eastern Roman Empire, the greatest monument of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Incidentally, Hagia Sophia means Holy Wisdom, the Church of Holy Wisdom. Today, Hagia Sophia is a mosque and today Byzantium is not Byzantium, not even Constantinople, it is Istanbul. But such things are irrelevant. It is a fact that under emperors such as Justinian the Great, Byzantine art and architecture scaled remarkable heights as i said the hagia sophia is an architectural marvel the byzantine goldsmiths the byzantine craftsmen created remarkable jewelry there were gold mines within the frontiers of the byzantine empire and they supplied gold to Byzantium for the goldsmiths, for the craftsmen to create pieces which were nothing short of marvels, nothing short of wonders. Even today you have the term Byzantine jewelry, the Byzantine style of jewelry using large quantities of gold using precious and semi-precious stones the point i'm trying to make is that the choice of byzantium was not accidental was not a random choice byzantium is for the poet the city of perfection the city of salvation in sailing to byzantium the poet leaves ireland the poet reaches Byzantium. In the present poem, there is an amplification on what is said in 
the first poem. Sailing to Byzantium and Byzantium are sister poems. Two of the greatest poems of 20th century British poetry. Yeats was fond of saying that if he could be given a month of antiquity, a month of antiquity, and leave to spend it and permission to spend it where he chose, he would spend it in Byzantium. So great was the fascination that Byzantium exerted on Yeats and Byzantium, the poem, is the result of not just Byzantium, the poem, sailing to Byzantium, as well as Byzantium. The Byzantium poems are the result of this fascination. The unpurged images of day recede. The emperor's drunken soldiery are abed. Night resonance recedes, night walker's song. After great cathedral gong, the starlit or a moonlit dome disdains all that man is, all mere complexities, the fury in the mire of human veins. It is as if the speaker is taking a long, slow walk through the city of Byzantium at night. The unpursed images of day recede. Unpursed means unpurified, impure. The poet feels that as the day has come to an end, as the night has begun, a sort of purification takes place throughout the city. The impure images recede, go back, become weak. The emperor's drunken soldiery are a bed. For example, the soldiers. The soldiers, notorious for their lack of education, lack of culture, lack of spirituality, lack of sophistication. They are now a bed. Probably they have taken a heavy drink before going to bed. The emperor's drunken soldiery are a bed. Night resonance recedes night walker's song. Even the sounds of the night have started receding. It's becoming more and more still. And the same is true the night walker's song. The night walkers are the prostitutes. I think we should call them sex workers now. Otherwise they might litigate against you. Even the sounds of the night have started receding as much as the song of the prostitutes. After great cathedral gong, gong is a metal disc which when struck produces a resonant sound, a resonant note. Gongs were used to announce the time after great cathedral gong. The cathedral is of course Hagia Sophia, the church of holy wisdom, the greatest church of the Eastern Roman Empire, the greatest monument of the Orthodox Church, the Hagia Sophia, the Church of Holy Wisdom, you must remember, was built by Emperor Justinian, Justinian the Great, to his admirers. 
as the patriarchal cathedral or the imperial capital of the Eastern Roman Empire, Constantinople. It is a marvel of architecture. It's a marvel of art. Today, it is a mosque. And for some time, for many decades, it was a museum. A starlit or a moonlit dome disdains all that manners, all mere complexities, the fury and the mire of human veins. A starlit or a moonlit dome disdains. This is, of course, the dome of the Hagia Sophia. All that man is. The dome seems to have nothing but contempt for everything human, all that man is, all mere complexities. And what is man? Nothing but a bundle of complexities. The fury in the mire of the human veins. Ultimately, that is what we are. That is what our bodies are. The fury, the anger, the emotion, the negative thinking, and the, and the mire. Mire is wet, sticky earth. But here it's used in a figurative sense to mean something, un something unpleasant, something complicated, something from which you try to escape but from which you cannot escape. Something undesirable, something dirty. The fury and the mire of the human veins. The contrast here is only an amplification of the contrast met with in Sailing to Byzantium. In Sailing to Byzantium, the contrast is between Ireland and Byzantium, between youth and age, between body and spirit. Here the poet says that the dome of the Hagia Sophia, the dome of the Church of Holy Wisdom, has nothing but contempt for what is human, for the bodies of human beings, for the essence of human beings. Ultimately, human beings are nothing but negative thoughts, and dirty emotions, dirty passions. It is this that is described in the last line of the stanza as the fury and the mire of the human veins. Can there be a greater contrast than the contrast between the negative thinking and the dirty passions that form the essence of the human being and the grand dome of the Hagia Sophia, the grand dome symbolizing holy wisdom, the grand dome symbolizing spiritual achievement, the grand dome symbolizing eternity and immortality. The dome is called the king of roofs in architecture. The king of roofs. It is looked upon as the greatest and the grandest roof. And the dome is a powerful symbol in literature, in mythology, in history, in culture. The dome symbolizes, among other things, the vault of heaven, the path to heaven. If there can be a heaven on earth, it is the dome. And you must remember that the dome is capable of, of enclosing a huge space, an enormous space, without any corner, without any angle, without the support of any column. It is very significant that the poet 
does not try even slightly to gloss over the sordid realities of the city of Byzantium. On the other hand, he accepts their existence, the drunken soldiers, the singing prostitutes, the drunken soldiers who are probably the customers of the singing prostitutes. The poet's point is that the culture of Byzantium, the civilization of Byzantium, constantly attempts to go far, far beyond and constantly succeeds in going far beyond these sordid realities. It can be said that the stanza is imagist. A few powerful images are presented in order to convey what the stanza wants to convey. The stanza is impressionist. A few impressions of the speaker are shared by the speaker with the reader, leaving the reader to reconstruct or to construct the rest of the picture. There is even a touch of surrealism in the stanza. It is as, as if the poet is walking at night in a spell of somnambulism. It is as if the poet is sleepwalking through the, through the city of Byzantium at night. The stanza is more painting than poetry. The impact of the stanza on the reader, on the reader is so powerful that the stanza is closer to the visual arts than to the literary arts. The stanza is more painting than poetry and you must remember that W.B. Yeats was the son of a painter and that the Yeats family was highly artistic on the whole and that Yeats himself, the poet himself dabbled in painting in his youth, in his early years. If this is poetry, this is certainly the poetry of a painter. There is the 1914 nightscape. I think it's oil on canvas. Istanbul at night by the Russian impressionist painter Pavel Benkov. I don't know whether I'm going too far when I suggest that it's quite possible that W.B. Yeats was exposed to works of art depicting Byzantium, Constantinople, Istanbul at night, such as Pavel Benkow's masterpiece, Istanbul at night and that he was inspired to write the lines under consideration by the impact of the painting on him. In fact, Istanbul, Constantinople exerted a powerful, cap a powerful fascination on many artists down the centuries and uh, the result of their being captivated by the history, culture, civilization of Byzantium, Constantinople, Istanbul was the production of masterpieces which W.B. Yeats as a keen student of art, especially, especially painting, a keen student of painting, could have accessed, be that as it may, 
There is no doubt that the opening stanza of Byzantium is closer to the to the fine art of painting than to the to the art of poetry, which it actually represents. Before we move to the second stanza, I would like to tell you that Byzantium is a rather difficult poem and that there is no one interpretation, no one reading of the poem which is acceptable to all. In fact, with some exaggeration, it can be said that no two critics can agree wholly on what the poem tries to convey. All that we can do is to analyze, evaluate and interpret the poem to the best of our ability and to try to present a reading which is justifiable, which is, convin which is convincing, which can be supported by evidence, which can be supported by arguments. So please don't worry if there is some part of the poem or some passage in the poem or some line or some word in the poem which you feel you're not able to comprehend fully. Let me read the second stanza. Before me floats an image, man or shade, shade more than man, more image than a shade. For Hades bobbin, bound in mummy cloth, may unwind the winding path. A mouth that has no moisture and no breath, breathless mouths may summon. I hail the superhuman. I call it death in life and life in death. The speaker goes for a walk through Byzantium maybe 10th century Byzantium. He goes for a walk not merely through the streets of Byzantium, but also through the streets of his imagination. And what does he come across in the streets of Byzantium? Before me floats an image, man or shade. He comes across an image he comes across something, he's not sure. It could be an image, it could be a man. It could be a shade. Image means representation. Image can mean statue, image can mean picture. Man, the thing that he comes across could be a real human being. Shade, spirit. Before me floats an image, man or shade. Shade more than man, more image than shade. Shade more than man. The speaker investigates. He discovers that the thing is not a human being, the thing is not a man. Shade more than man. The thing is more a spirit than a shade, more image than a shade. Not even a shade, it's an image, it's a representation. It's all very vague, it's all very confusing. The speaker is not sure. For Hades bobbin bound in mummy cloth may unwind the winding path. Hades is the underworld. In Greek mythology, Hades is the god of the underworld. It's also the underworld. It's a place where you go after you die. Bobbin. Bobbin is, how shall I put it, a stick or a crown or a cylinder on which thread is wrapped. 
or uh, not only thread it can be wire it can be tape for Hades bobbin bound in mummy cloth mummy is a dead body which is preserved you have the mummies of Egypt the mummies of Egypt are very famous but uh, Egypt is not the only place where mummies are found they have been found in Africa in parts of Arabia even in South America a mummy is a dead body which is preserved usually spices were used in order to preserve the dead bodies now I think chemicals are used and the mummies were treated with spices after certain organs were removed and they were bound in cloth that is what the poet means when he speaks of mummy cloth mummy cloth is the cloth with which the dead body is bundled may unwind the winding path unwind the mummy cloth starts unwinding the winding path the winding path is the path taken by the soul after death what is the poet trying to convey quite difficult I shall try to interpret it to the best of my ability almost all religions agree that your actions in the present life decide your life after death what you do before death decides what happens to you after death that is what these lines convey there is an unraveling of your life bound in mummy cloth may unwind the winding path as your soul travels along the winding path after death there is an unraveling and what you did before your death comes back to you after your death this is the law that is followed in Hades in the underworld once you reach the underworld once you reach the underworld the soul has to undergo the winding journey the long drawn journey of life after death and that is determined by your actions in your life before death to put it in another way there is an unraveling of your life after death and the actions carried out by you before death come back to you in a particular form a mouth that has no moisture and no breath breathless mouths may summon a mouth that has no moisture and no breath is a mouth which is dead a mouth which is dead the mouth of a dead person breathless mouths may summon summon means call here it means bring close interact with what is the poet trying to convey we are unable to communicate with the dead but the dead can communicate with one another the poet's point is that life before death and life after death are two planes of existence two planes of existence let us not dismiss life after death let us not think that life after death does not exist because just because we are unable to interact with those who live after death on the other hand those who are dead can very well interact with communicate with those who are dead like them it is just another plane of existence life before death and life after death are two differing planes dimensions of existence what the poet is trying to convey here 
is a cardinal principle of all the religions of the world. I don't think there is any religion which says that there is no life after death. One of the fundamental principles of every religion of the world, to my knowledge, at least every major religion of the world, is that there is a life after death. That is what the poet is trying to say here. Let us not dismiss life after death as non-existent. Because there is a life after death. Only thing is that it belongs to another plane, it belongs to another dimension. Be it Christianity or be it Islam or be it mainstream Hinduism or be it paganism or be it the ancient Egyptian religion, every religion claims that there is life after death. What happens after your death may vary according to the religious perspective, but there is no religion to my knowledge which says that there is no life after death. And this is precisely what the poet is trying to convey through these lines. I hail the superhuman. I call it death in life and life in death. To hail means to acclaim, to acclaim publicly, to praise publicly, to praise enthusiastically. I hail the superhuman. That is the point. In sailing to Byzantium, the poet leaves Ireland because it's a very human place. And he goes to Byzantium because that is a superhuman place. Superhuman in the sense of focusing on the aspects which are superior to the merely human. Focusing on the intellectual, the artistic, the creative, and above all, the spiritual. Superhuman. I hail the superhuman. I hail the divine. I hail the, the, the intellectual, the creative, the artistic, the spiritual. I hail the superhuman. Death in life and life in death can be interpreted in more than one way. I shall present what appears to me to be the most appropriate reading. Death in life. I call it death in life. Any monument of the soul's magnificence can be produced only through death in life. Death in life. Any monument of artistic achievement, any monument of architectural achievement, any monument of spiritual achievement, any monument of intellectual achievement can be produced only by the artist being prepared to destroy his own life. Take the Hagia Sophia, for example. The artist who created it, the architects who created it, the workers who created it exhausted their life, destroyed their life in order to create it. I call it death in life. Unless there is death in life, great monuments of the soul's magnificence cannot be created. I call it death in life and life in death. It is life and death because it is eternal, because it is immortal. It, it is something which exists forever. In that death, there is life. There, is, there has to be death in the life of the artist, of the creator, of the, of the saint, in order to create it. But once it is created, it has an eternal life. It is an eternal monument. It is immortal. And it becomes life in death. Let us go through stanza three. Miracle bird or golden handiwork. More miracle than bird or handiwork. Planted 
on the starlit golden bough can like the cocks of Hades crow or by the moon embittered scorn aloud in glory of changeless metal common bird or petal and all complexities of mire or blood this stanza is a kind of amplification on what is contained in the in the concluding stanza of sailing to Byzantium in the fourth stanza of sailing to Byzantium the poet says once out of nature I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing but such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold and gold enameling many of the readers of selling to Byzantium including the close friends of the poet including critics including Thomas Sturge Moore the poet and critic in particular were, una were unable were unable to comprehend fully what the poet what WB Yeats was trying to convey through the closing stanza of sailing to Byzantium the present stanza of Byzantium the stanza under consideration of Byzantium is an effort to amplify on what is said in the fourth stanza of sailing to Byzantium and an effort to answer the questions raised by the readers of the earlier Byzantium poem miracle bird a golden handiwork more miracle than bird or handiwork miracle something extraordinary something remarkable something phenomenal which cannot be explained by natural laws which cannot be explained by scientific laws and hence which can be attributed to divine intervention miracle the miracles of Je Jesus Christ Jesus Christ uh, turning water into wine miracle bird a golden handiwork golden handiwork handiwork in the sense of work done by hands especially in a very skillful manner a work of art created by the hands miracle bird or golden handiwork more miracle than bird or handiwork that is it from the poet's point of view the golden bird is of course a bird is of course a handiwork is a is a work of art crafted by the hands but above everything else it's a miracle I don't know whether you get the point that the poet is trying to make the golden bird is of course a bird and what is a bird a bird is a creature which feather with feathers which typically flies birds lay eggs birds are creatures with feathers that lay eggs and which typically fly because there are birds which don't fly the golden bird is a bird it is a work of art it's a work of art lovingly crafted by the hands it's a handiwork but according to the poet above all above everything else it's a miracle why is it a miracle that is explained by the lines that follow planted on the starlit golden bough can like the cocks of Hades crow 
It is a recorded fact that in the palace of the Byzantine Emperor there was a golden tree on which mechanical birds made of gold perched and that the birds could be made to flutter and to sing. In fact, the opulence of the court of the Byzantine emperors has few parallels in history. Can like the cocks of Hades crow? Why cocks of Hades? In Greek mythology, there were, there were cocks in Hades in the underworld. And the crowing of the cocks of Hades signaled the ending of one life and the beginning of another. The conclusion of life before death and the dawn of a new life, the dawn of a new life, the beginning of life after death. The poet's point is that the singing of the singing of the mechanical birds, the golden birds on the golden bough, on the golden tree, in the palace of the Byzantine Emperor is as significant as the crowing of the cocks of Hades because it signifies, it signals the transition from one level of existence to another level of existence. It signifies the movement from the world of the body, of the flesh, of the veins, to the world of intellectual, creative, artistic, spiritual achievement. All by the moon embittered, scorn aloud, in glory of changeless metal, common bird or petal, and all complexities of mire or blood. These are important lines. The poet imagines the golden bird to be singing by moonlight at night. The bird is embittered. Embittered means angry, upset, disappointed, especially by the manner in which one has been treated. I don't know whether I shall die an embittered man. Why is the golden bird embittered? It took me quite some time, it took me quite some years to try to understand why the poet has used the word embittered in this context. Yeats is not a poet to waste words. And Yeats is not a poet to use one word more than necessary. Why embittered? My understanding is that the bird is embittered, angry, upset, disappointed. Because not many people can understand what it is. Because its meaning, its significance, its symbolism is not understood by most people, including by the poet's friend, the poet T Thomas Sturge Moore. It's his friend, the poet Thomas Sturge Moore. The golden bird is a spectacular specimen of Byzantine art. The golden bird is a magnificent product of Byzantine civilization. The golden bird is a splendid symbol of intellectual, artistic, creative, spiritual achievement. 
the golden bird is completely unlike every other bird is completely unlike a real bird a bird in flesh and blood but this is not understood by most people and so the bird is embittered or by the moon embittered scorn aloud the bird sings aloud and the poet imagines the bird to be scorning expressing its contempt expressing its disdain in glory of changeless metal that is what the bird is in the glory in the greatness in the grandeur of changeless metal of eternal metal of immortal metal common bird or petal and all complexities of mire or blood the golden bird expresses its contempt its disdain its scorn for common bird or petal the bird the golden bird is perched on a golden tree with golden flowers and the golden bird is nothing but scorn for ordinary birds and ordinary flowers common bird or petal and all complexities of mire and blood mire and blood stand for the body the golden bird which is a work of art which is a work of craftsmanship which is the ultimate achievement of a great civilization has nothing but contempt for things of the flesh things made of blood and flesh has nothing but contempt for living bodies and what are living bodies complexities of mire or blood i am reminded of a line from the nightingale ode of john keats i think it's in the penultimate stanza the opening line of the penultimate stanza thou wast not born for death immortal bird i quote once again thou wast not born for death immortal bird and quote i feel that this line can be addressed to the golden bird in its poem byzantium in the poem under consideration it's very appropriate it's very applicable we can tell the golden bird in byzantium thou wast not born for death immortal bird i think uh, there is a muted reference to the fairy tale the nightingale of hans christian andersen the plot of the fairy tale is somewhat different from what is said in this stanza but still we can say that very probably very probably wb aids was influenced by hans christian andersen's story the nightingale influenced by the fairy tale of the nightingale we have now reached the penultimate stanza at midnight on the emperor's pavement flit flames that no faggot feeds nor steel has lit no storm disturbs flames begotten of flame where blood begotten spirits come and all complexities of fury leave dying into a dance an agony of trance an agony of flame that cannot singe a sleeve we now come to the penultimate stanza it's a rather difficult stanza but we shall try to explain it as best as we can from the emperor's palace with its golden tree on whose golden bough is perched a mechanical bird made of gold from the emperor's palace with its golden tree and its golden bird we now come to the emperor's pavement 
and it is night. In fact, it is midnight. Midnight is said to be the best time, the most appropriate time for black magic, for ghosts to emerge. You have uh, the ghost in Shakespeare's Hamlet appearing at midnight in the famous ghost scene. And uh, it is midnight. And what do we find on the emperor's pavement? Pavement is the raised path on the side of the road for the use of pedestrians. I think another word is sidewalk. At midnight, the emperor's pavement or on the emperor's pavement, flit. Flit means move quickly, move quickly, move swiftly, move lightly. Flames that no faggot feeds nor steel has lit. We find on the pavement of the emperor flames. But these are unusual flames. They are not physical flames. They are metaphysical flames. They are not fed by faggots. Faggots are bundles of firewood. They don't need firewood. They don't, they don't need fuel to sustain themselves. Nor steel has lit in the past Steel was used to generate sparks, which in turn would be used to generate fire, to start a fire. But the flames that we meet with on the emperor's pavement in Byzantium at midnight are metaphysical flames, which do not need fuel to sustain them, which were not generated by steel. We must remember that we come across the flames at midnight. And midnight is the best time, the most appropriate time for black magic, for ghosts to emerge, for uh, spirits to walk about. I am reminded of the ghost in Shakespeare's Hamlet, which if I remember correctly, I am speaking offhand appears four times in the play, always at night, and twice it appears at midnight or just after midnight. It has to leave the scene when the cocks start crowing. That is, uh, by the, uh, it has to leave the scene when night comes to an end. The flames that we meet with on the Emperor's pavement in the present poem are rather peculiar flames. They are not disturbed by storms. Storms can put out ordinary physical flames, but not the flames that we meet with in the poem under discussion. Flames begotten of flame, flames born out of flames. That is, they are metaphysical flames, they are spiritual flames which exist on a realm of their own, which are generated from the kind of flame, the kind of flames they are. They have very little in common with the physical flames, the real flames that we meet with in our world, where blood begotten spirits come and all complexities of fury leave, dying into a dance, an agony of trance, an agony of flame that cannot singe a sleeve. These lines describe the purification process that the souls undergo after death in order to take them, in order to be acceptable, to go to heaven, to go to paradise. I am sure that the poet is here influenced by the Christian concept, especially the Catholic concept of the purgatory. Those who are damned, great sinners are damned. I think I am going to be damned, being a very great sinner myself. And I am sure to go to hell. And I understand that on the gateway to hell, it's written, All hope abandon, 
ye who enter here, all help abandon. Ye who enter here, those who enter hell have to give up all help because they are going to suffer eternal damnation. I very much look forward to that. I think it was Mark Twain who said, I like heaven for the climate. I like heaven for the climate and hell for the company. I agree that the climate of hell is rather unbearable because I have to endure hellfire. But I am sure that I will, I will have excellent company there. Those who are in heaven, they are all very boring guys. I am extremely sure that I will have marvelous company in hell. I am getting distracted. What we should focus on here is the concept of purgatory. Those who sin, but those who are not great sinners, are sent to purgatory, where their souls are purified and they are prepared to enter heaven or enter paradise. And in purgatory you find the fires of purgatory, which burn the soul which, and which cleanse the soul. It's extremely painful, it's extremely agonizing but it's worth it and as I said H was influenced by the Christian concept the Catholic concept of purgatory and also by reading of the Divine Comedy of Dante where Dante describes how souls are purified in purgatory given a choice I would like to go to hell rather than to purgatory where blood begotten spirits come, human souls which had once been clothed in flesh and blood, and all complexities of fury leave. They put an end to the complexities of earthly existence, to the complexities of worldly existence, dying into a dance, an agony of trance, an agony of flame that cannot singe a sleeve. That is the most interesting part of it. The flame that we come across cannot singe, cannot burn. Singe means burn, especially burn lightly. Cannot singe a sleeve, the sleeve of a dress. Cannot burn anything. The flame that we come across is a metaphysical flame and it cannot burn anything physical. It is this flame that burns the souls of the dead men, which purifies the souls of the dead men and prepares them for their entry into heaven or their entry into paradise. It is quite possible that W.B. Yeats was influenced by the 14th century no play, no play Moto Mesuka Moto Mesuka in which a girl burns eternally out of guilt while writing these lines we have at last reached the last answer a straddle on the dolphin's mire and blood spirit after spirit the smithies break the flood the golden smithies of the emperor marbles of the dancing flower break bitter furies of complexity those images that yet fresh images beget the dolphin torn that gong tormented see this is also a difficult stanza rather difficult stanza 
we shall try to interpret it as best as we can. This is very much a continuation of the penultimate stanza. In the fourth stanza, we found souls being purified by metaphysical flames. In the last stanza, in the fifth stanza, we are told what happens to those souls. A straddle on the dolphin's mire and blood. A straddle means to sit with your legs apart. I saw my girlfriend riding a motorcycle, a straddle. Here, the poet refers to the spirits sitting on the dolphins. They have been purged, they have been purified, and they are sitting a straddle with their legs apart, with their legs hanging on either side of the dolphin. A straddle on the dolphin's mire and blood. Mire and blood stands for, the poet has been repeatedly using these words, the passions, the complexities, the, the furies, the emotions, the karmas of earthly existence, of worldly life. The spirits are sitting a straddle on the dolphins. The dolphin has always been a positive symbol Sailors used to think that seeing a dolphin brought them good luck because after, after a long voyage, when they came across a dolphin, they understood that they were near land. And they sighed a sigh of relief and, and felt that the dolphin had brought them good luck. Dolphin has always been charged with rich positive symbolism in Western literature, in Western culture. We shall discuss that in further detail later. A, a straddle on the dolphin's mire and blood. The point is that it is through the body that the soul reaches salvation. The soul cannot exist without the body. It is through worldly life that we reach spiritual achievement. If there is no worldly life, if there is no earthly life, we cannot go to heaven. There is only one path to paradise and that path passes through this earth. A straddle on the dolphin's mire and blood, spirit of the spirit. The poet sees one spirit after another spirit, each on a dolphin, a straddle, sitting with legs apart. They are going to paradise, they are going to heaven. The smithies break the flood. The golden smithies of the emperor. This smithy is a workshop of an ironsmith or a blacksmith or of a craftsman, of a goldsmith. The, the smithies break the flood. What does the poet mean by break the flood? I think we can interpret it to mean put an end to the flood. The flood stands for earthly existence. The flood stands for worldly life. The, the, the flood stands for the mire and blood. The smithies break the flood, the golden smithies of the emperor. Marbles of the dancing floor break bitter furies of complexity. The poet believes that the smithies of the emperor, the golden smithies of the emperor, the workshops patronized by the Byzantine emperor, the, the marble floors of the emperor's palace, the great artistic achievements, the great monuments of the soul created by Byzantine civilization are capable of putting an end to the torment, to the torture, to the meaninglessness of worldly life, of earthly existence and giving one salvation giving one passage to paradise, a passage to paradise. The smithies break the flood, 
the golden smithies of the emperor, marbles of the dancing floor, break bitter furies of complexity. That is what they do. The complexities of worldly life, the complexities of earthly existence are put an end to by the smithies of the emperor, by the golden, golden smithies of the emperor, by the uh, gold workshops of the goldsmiths, of the artisans, of the craftsmen, patronized by the Byzantine emperor, of the marble flowers of the emperor's palace, of the artistic and cultural achievements of the Byzantine civilization. Break bitter furies of complexity. Those images that yet fresh images beget. I think this could be interpreted to refer again to worldly life, to earthly existence, to to the to the body, to the flesh, to everything that goes with the body, to everything that goes with the flesh. The problem is that one thing leads to another. One, one image begets another image. Those images that it fresh images beget. It is a chain. It is an unbreakable chain unless you are able to break it. And the only way to break it is to attain spiritual, artistic, cultural, creative achievements. The poet's point is that in Byzantium, the souls of the dead men are purified by metaphysical flames and carried by dolphins to paradise. This is something that happens only in Byzantium. It does not happen in London or Dublin. This is something which happens only in the 10th century, the Byzantine Renaissance. It does not happen in 20th century Ireland or 20th century England. Souls are purified in metaphysical fires and carried by dolphins to paradise. That dolphin torn, that gong tormented sea. The souls are able to cross the sea. The sea across which the dolphins cut across. The, the, the sea across, across which the dolphins stare. The, that gong tormented sea. That sea which is tormented, which is tortured, which is troubled by the sound of the gong of the cathedral of Hagia Sophia in Byzantium, reminding us that we are still on this earth, we are still in this world. The C stands for earthly existence, worldly life, and through the sea of earthly existence, through the sea of worldly life, the dolphins carry the spirits which are purified by metaphysical fires to paradise. Let us try to take a holistic overview of the entire poem. We have finished reading a poem which we cannot claim to have understood completely, but which we are well aware is a great poem. When I was a child, I used to, when I was a schoolboy, I used to worry about the meaning of each poem. But later I realized that meaning is just one dimension, one facet of a poem. Meaning is not everything. A poem is not a letter. A poem is not an argument. A poem is not a thesis. Let us not worry unduly about not being able to understand every damn thing in the poem. 
But the good thing about WB8 is that however much he leans, leans to imagism, however much he leans to surrealism, as he does in the present poem, he never ever completely allows the disappearance of a thread of reason, a thread of logic in the thematic trajectory of the poem. The thread of reason, the thread of logic, maybe hidden, maybe camouflaged, maybe invisible at moments, but it is there. The poet never lets go of the thread of reason. Let us try to identify that thread of reason, that thread of logic running from the first stanza, from the first line, the first stanza to the fifth stanza, to the last stanza, to the last line of the last stanza. In order to appreciate the poem and the discussion, you have to accept certain concepts of the poet. The poet believes that earthly existence, that worldly life is squalid, is dirty, is sordid. We have to aim to attain salvation. We have to aim to go to paradise. And according to the poet, the way to salvation, the way to paradise lies through artistic, spiritual, intellectual creation. It is only through the monuments of the soul's magnificence that a spirit can attain salvation. There is a contradiction in this. On the one hand, the body drags you down into the mire, sinks you into the mire. The body is dirty, sordid, squalid, traps you in all kinds of complexities. You have to escape from the clutches of the body in order to attain salvation. On the other hand, the path to salvation runs through the body. Because the soul cannot exist on its own. There cannot be a soul without a body. What we have to do according to the poet is to ensure that we outgrow the body. We develop beyond the limitations of the body. We escape from the mire and blood. We overcome the complexities. And we reach the pinnacles of intellectual, artistic, creative, spiritual achievements. Byzantium, this poem, tells the story of how the spirits which are very much like us, trapped in the complexities of earthly life, in the complexities of worldly life, in the sordid world, in the squalid world of the body, of the flesh, are purified in metaphysical fires and how they reach paradise by completely dedicating themselves to the creation of monuments of intellectual, artistic, creative, spiritual significance. 
I would like to point out that one of the fundamental strengths of the poem is that it is able to establish a very sustained bipolarity. Bipolarity. It is as if the poet sees the entire universe through the lens of bipolarity. Body versus soul. Nature versus art. Flesh versus metal. The physical versus the metaphysical. Organic decay versus artistic immortality. Human imperfection versus perfection of art. Worldly life or terrestrial life versus soul life or spiritual life. Let us consider the stylistic aspects of the poem. We can begin with the title. There is no doubt that the poem is a very appropriate title. It is just one word. It's a very short title, but a very appropriate title. I've already said that it was after much effort that W.B. Yeats came to the conclusion that Byzantium, better known as Constantinople and now known as Istanbul, is his spiritual home. As I've already said, the poet could very well, very well have said that Athens was a spiritual home, a realm was a spiritual home, but he did not do that for very obvious reasons, for very solid reasons. The poet was fascinated by the civilization, by the culture of the Eastern Roman Empire, its relentless civilization moving from century to century, even while the Western Roman Empire was in a shambles. The poet was fascinated by the achievements of the civilization of Byzantium, of the artistic monuments, of the art of the architectural marvel that is the Hagia Sophia of the miracles of craftsmanship created by the Byzantine goldsmiths, by the spiritual attainments of the civilization of the Eastern Roman Empire. The poem is divided into five stanzas. At each stanza, is further divided into eight lines. So we have five stanzas composed of eight lines each. The rhyme scheme is A, A, B, B, C, D, D, C. I repeat, A, A, B, B, C, D, D, C. The poet is not overly careful about maintaining the rhymes. There are places where the rhymes are not perfect. The poem contains striking imagery. In fact, I would say that there is an imagist element in the poem. The totality of the meaning of the poem is conveyed as much through images as through 
the other elements in the poem. The important images in the poem include those of night, the Hagia Sophia, spirits, artifacts, metaphysical flames, dolphins, and the sea. The images are sharply etched and they leave an indelible imprint on the mind of the reader. Every schoolboy knows that W.B. Yeats is a symbolist and a gifted symbolist at that. The symbols in Byzantium, in the poem Byzantium, speak eloquently to the reader. We have the symbol of the dome. As I've already observed, the dome stands for the vault of heaven. In architecture, the dome is the king of roofs. There cannot be a roof greater, more glorious than a dome. The dome stands for cosmic order, for artistic and spiritual achievement. You must remember that the dome which is referred to as a starlit or a moonlit dome in the opening stanza of the poem is the dome of the Hagia Sophia and the Hagia Sophia is certainly a fantastic architectural marvel. In the third stanza we have the symbol of the bird. The bird is made of gold. The bird is a mechanical bird. The bird perches on a golden tree and sings like a real bird. We have met the bird already in the earlier Byzantium poem, in Sailing to Byzantium. The bird symbolizes art. The bird stands for artistic achievement. The bird symbolizes the ability of art to transcend time. In the third stanza, the poet speaks of the glory of changeless metal. That is what the poet has in mind. The eternity of art, the immortality of art, as opposed to the transience of life, of nature. In the fourth stanza of the poem, we have the flames. The flames are not real flames. They are not fed by faggots. They are not generated by steel. On the other hand, they are metaphysical flames. They symbolize illumination. They symbolize purification. They remind us of the flames in purgatory, in Christian mythology, in Catholic mythology. They remind us of the flames in purgatory as described by Dante in his Divine Comedy. The flames symbolize the process of purification that, that the soul has to undergo in order to be eligible to enter paradise. 
In the last stanza of the poem, we have two important symbols. The first of these is the dolphin. The dolphin is an aquatic mammal, grey in colour, with a pointed mouth. In classical mythology, the dolphin is associated with the gods. In the Middle Ages, sailors looked upon the dolphin as a symbol of good luck. From a Christian point of view, the dolphin could symbolize Jesus Christ, who, according, Christi according to Christian thinking, is solely capable, who alone is capable of transporting the human soul to heaven. The dolphin stands for the passage from earth to heaven, from the squalid life in this world to the heavenly life in paradise. The second symbol in the last turn is the sea. The sea stands for many things. The sea symbolizes earthly existence, worldly life, the squalid, dirty, sordid life that we have to undergo as a result of being tied to our bodies. It is very significant that the dolphins carry the souls which, which sit astride on them across the sea, obviously to paradise. In the note that W.B. Yeats wrote in his diary, before he wrote the poem, the note which is the germ of the poem, the note which contains the idea of the poem, he specifically mentions paradise. How the dolphins carry the souls across the sea to paradise. If we take that into account, we can assert that the sea stands for the sea of life. What in Indian culture is called the Samsara Sagara, the ocean of worldly life, the ocean of earthly existence, which we have to cross in order to reach salvation. It may be observed that the poem is immensely en enriched as a result of allusions and references to bygone civilizations, beginning with the title itself, Byzantium, alluding to the glorious civilization of the Eastern Roman Empire, to the civilization of ancient Egypt, alluded to through the term mummy cloth, to the civilization of ancient Greece, and ancient Rome, perhaps, through the term the Cox of Hades. The poet makes use of pathetic fallacy in the opening stanza, as in a starlit or a moonlit dome disdains. He thus gives a very human attribute to the dome, which is not human, which is not human, not just not human, it is inanimate. The poet makes repeated use of alliteration, put very loosely, defined very loosely 
Alliteration is a repetition of a consonant sound. There is more to it than that, but we need not go into the details. The poet makes use of alliteration in day recede, the fury and the mire, bobbin bound, a mouth that has no moisture, dying into a dance. The poet makes use of assonance. Defined very loosely, assonance is the repetition of a vowel sound. Examples are unwind the winding, unwind the winding, and flames begotten of flame. The poet makes use of sisura. Sisura is a pause, is a gap in speech in the middle of a line. The poet makes use of sisura in the second line of the last stanza. Spirit after spirit, the smithies break the flood. Enchantment is the movement of meaning and momentum from one line to the next line without any break. In the poem under discussion, the poet repeatedly makes use of enchantment. I shall give a couple of examples. In the opening stanza, the poet says, Dome disdains all that manners. Dome disdains all that. There is no pause after disdains. Typically, in enchantment, there is no punctuation. There is no punctuation at the end of the first line under consideration. And the reader is carried swiftly and surely from the first line under consideration to the next line. In the third stanza, we have scorn aloud in glory of changeless metal. Scorn aloud in glory. There is no pause after aloud. There is no punctuation after aloud. Scorn aloud in glory of changeless metal. Similarly, we have the opening line and the second line of the penultimate stanza. The emperor's pavement flit flames that no faggot feeds. What flit? Flames flit. So there is no pause, there is no punctuation, there is no gap, there is no break after flit. The emperor's pavement flit flames that no faggot feeds. The meter of Byzantium, the meter used in Byzantium is iambic pentameter. Pentameter means every line has five feet. Penta means five. Iamb means that every foot consists of two syllables. The first syllable is a short syllable. The second syllable is a long syllable. The first syllable is an unstressed syllable. The second syllable is a stressed syllable. But the problem with Byzantium is that the scansion is very challenging. W. E. Yeats is consistently experimental when it comes to meter in the poem. And only a few lines are pure iambic pentameter. In fact, when I was 
a student. It took me several days of consistent effort. You must remember that our resources were very limited. Those were days of resources which were extremely limited. And it took me days, several days of consistent effort to work out the scansion of Byzantium of WBH.